It's, it's so nice to be with you all today. It's been a while. Um, I, um, let's see, so let me make this a full screen. So as, as um, Bird mentioned, the title is, it seems a little obnoxious, Mr. Genius. Um, <laughs> Wow. It started as a as a as a joke with <laughs> with one of my um, former students uh, who is the co-author in the paper because the the field of manual organization is one where it's kind of there's a plethora of, of acronyms and everyone tries to outdo the, the the last paper in terms of having a cool acronym and yeah. so we wanted to to end to end it all. Um, um, Sorry, would you mind? Yeah, I, by the way, ask you all to mute your um, except for Eric, to mute your your um, Zoom. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so this all started as a as a running joke, and I'll explain what what Mister actually stands for. Mr. and then genius means means something that's actually connected to to Jamie Robbins' work. Um, and so I'll, I'll get into that. Um, my collaborators are Paulo Sun. Um, who was a former student and is a faculty at National University of Singapore. Uh, Ting Yi, who is a current postdoc uh, in Dylan Small's group, but uh, collaborated with me on this, uh, has been collaborating with me and others on this work. And, and Zhonghua Liu, who was um, Shi Hong Lin's um, postdoc at, at HSPH, and now he is a faculty at Hong Kong U. And um, I, I used to, uh, before this past summer, I, I spent um, the past seven years every summer um, spending a few weeks in, in in Hong Kong. So I have a few collaborations there, and and, and Zhong Hua is one of my closest collaborators there. Um, so everything here that that seems interesting and, and and new is is really out of the this collaboration with with them. Any mistakes are all mine. Um, as you all know, fundamental to all IV methods is the key assumption that one has observed a pre-exposure of confounded instrumental variable known, at, known to satisfy three core assumptions. One, that the IV is associated with the treatment, also sometimes referred to as IV relevant. Two, that the IV is independent of any unmeasured confounders, sometimes conditional or measured covariates. And three, to satisfy the exclusion restriction that the IV affects the outcome only through its effects on the exposure. And this is usually summarized, these three assumptions are summarized under this, using this DAG. And so I will refer to this DAG as the core IV model. Um, G is the gene, A is the endogenous variable, the treatment of interest, and Y is the outcome, and, and U is our measure confounder. And so I'm already thinking of, of Mendelian randomization studies where genetic variants are used as the as the candidate IVs. So this is the canonical model for um, MR analysis. A variable satisfying these assumptions can be hard to find in practice, but if a valid IV is identified, it may be used to reduce the evidentiary gap between observational and experimental study data, um, designs. Um, there are many examples of IVs in the literature. Uh, as I mentioned earlier today, I'm gonna um, focus on genetic variation as a and manual randomization. And this is by far the leading application in health sciences, um, other than thousands of papers to date, I think, uh, using um, an MR type framework. And interestingly enough, um, the IV framework seems also to be the most problematic for, for this application. And this is also a fact that has um, now, I think, gained recognition even in the MR. Um, literature. And what has happened is actually really interesting is that the folks who are most interested in applying this method have been the ones who have been pushing for technological development to relax some of some of the core assumptions that do not really need seem to fit in the MR setting. And so obviously you're not, you have to put something in to take something out. So relaxing is not quite the right term. It's basically shifting the set of identifying assumptions. And so I'm going to present some work that we've been doing in this space. Um, today. So assumptions IV1 to IV3, not sufficient by themselves for point identification of point treatment effect without an additional assumption. They only provide partial identification or bounds. Um, depending on the nature of this first assumption, one obtains a very specific type of treatment effect under the core IV assumption. And a fourth assumption, so here are some examples. Sometimes people assume one of the which I'm not going to go into details, but that allows them to identify the so-called local average treatment effect, 
uh, comply average treatment effect, which is given here. Sometimes um, they assume certain of homogeneity, they make certain homogeneity assumptions, such as in Jamie's work, um, where he identifies the average treatment effect on the treated by assuming that that effect is independent of the IV. Um, and then uh, also in, in my own work with a former postdoc in Limbo, uh, I was still at Harvard, um, we, we connected it to, um, found some sufficient condition for identifying the, the population average cause and effect, which is often the quantity most of interest. Um, and it requires thinking about two kinds of contrast. The first is the conditional cause and effect if you were to condition on you. And the second is the first stage association between the IV and the treatment on the additive scale. And so uh, conditional on you. So in principle, those are two functions of you. Um, but we, what we showed was that in fact, if, if one of these two assumptions hold that in fact, the average causal effect is homogeneous in you, that there's no interaction causal interaction between you and the treatment, or the first stage regression is homogeneous in you, that there is no interaction between U and G in, in causing A on the additive scale. If either of those assumptions um, hold, um, you can identify the average treatment effect for the whole population. The first one is not that surprising. The second one is somewhat surprising, um, but it, in fact, you can connect it if you're thinking of a causal IV. It, it is essentially entails stating that um, the compliance type is not predictive of, uh, that U is not predictive of the compliance type, which can coexist with our measure conformity. So that's one way of thinking of it. Um, an example of a model where this assumption might, might, might hold is for the first one would be a linear regression if I had measured U, where um, A and U do not interact, or a linear regression of, of A where G and U do not interact, okay, on the additive scale. So you only need one of these two, but if one of them were to hold, you could identify the average causal effect. In fact, this is stronger than what you need. In fact, it suffices that the above two effects are uncorrelated. That is gamma AU and alpha GU are uncorrelated. And we refer to this as no one measure can a common effect modifier. And so the idea is that usually we assume no, um, no uh, common, uh, um, no unmeasure common um, factor. Um, that's usually the assumption of exchangeability that we measure all the confounders. The, the, the ID setting allows us to relax that, but we, in this setting, at least, we require that there, there are no uh, measured common effect modifier. There are no measured effect modifier that modify the treatment and, uh, and also modify the effect of treatment on the outcome, but also modify the effect of the ID on the treatment. Okay. Interestingly, um, in, in case of binary IV and binary treatment, actually in general, um, the ETT is identified um, by what's known as the, the, the wild estimate. So, so the wild estimate is just a statistic that you compute. You compute the effect of the IV on the treatment. You compute the effect of the IV on the outcome. You take the ratio of the two. This denominator is sometimes known as the, the compliance rate. And so you're taking the intent to treat analysis, the IV on the outcome, and then you are adjusting it. You're blowing it up by the compliance rate. Okay, and that's the interpretation of that. Um, in general, you can rewrite this equation as, as this. Um, and this is the notation I'm going to prefer because it will allow for continuous A as well uh, and, and continuous G, non, non diachronomous G. Um, and so this is a covariance between Y and the, and the SNP, and you divide by the covariance between uh, A and the SNP. So that's the wall estimate. That's the basis for identifying the causal effect. It's a statistic that you can always compute, but to interpret it causally, you would have to require one of the, the first that the core IV assumption, IV1 to IV3 hold. And then depending on which interpretation you seek, you will need to ensure that either this assumption IV4 holds or the assumption IV4 um, um, dash, whatever this is, um, prime holds or IV4 um, star holds, and then you have the corresponding interpretation of your causal effects. So this is all well known in the literature. So what's, what's new here? Um, <clears throat> so now let's worry about diagnosing possible violations of any of the three core assumptions. This is obviously important applications, otherwise result may be biased and inference is incorrect. It's also important to question the fourth assumption leading to identification, whether monotonicity or homogeneity assumptions. 
the literature on the literature on methods to diagnose practical violation of ID relevance is quite rich, primarily driven by econometrician, several external methods to address weak ID identification and inference, the state of the art rely on many weak ID asymptotics, so-called many weak ID asymptotics. I'll come back to this later on. Um, we'll first consider more recent literature aimed at diagnosing and resolving violation of assumption ID3, exclusion restriction, which in, in my mind is the most problematic in MR study. Uh, and we'll replace it with an alternative identifier assumption, then we'll consider many weak invalid ideas asymptotics to address the weak ID bias in MR. So MR, each individual SNP, although it might be causally related or strongly associated with the, the treatment, the effect size is typically very small. So that, that could lead to weak ID problems. So violation of ID3, the exclusion restriction, um, is often suspected in Mendel randomization studies where the candidate ID G, uh, for example, suppose that we're looking at the effect of BMI on depression. And so the IV, popular IV there is FTO. Um, but it's possible that FTO can uh, may affect depression through a pathway not involving um, exposure BMI. In fact, it would be very strange to assume that it doesn't. Okay, that, that somehow your measurement of BMI captures the entire association between um, FTO and, and the outcome of interest. And so that would have to be exceptional condition that would lead to that to be true. Technically, the method I'm going to describe are a misnomer to call them. Um, it's a misnomer to call them IV methods because I'm no longer going to invoke IV assumption three. So I'm going to allow for G to in fact have a causal effect of Y. This is sometimes referred to as pleiotropy pleiotropic effect of the, of the candidate SNP. And, and we'll consider assumptions under which in, under this graph, one can still use, identify the causal effect of on Y accounting for, for U. So there are two types of methods that have emerged. As I mentioned, there's been a lot of activity in the last 10 years on this. And I'm just gonna mention a few and you'll see all the acronyms coming up now. Um, there are so-called me me meta methods, methods based on published summary statistics. Um, this, this effort, and they use meta-analysis techniques to analyze them. This effort has been led by epidemiologists and some biostatisticians, primarily, primarily in context of MR, with epi the epicenter of these activities is largely in the UK. George Davis Smith, which, who I think is gonna be speaking here in a couple of weeks, and, uh, and interestingly, will be speaking about MR assumptions. And so it'll be interesting to see he's been involved in this type of work. And this most prominent, uh, the most prominent method appeared to include MR Egger, um, median weighted median um, methods, MR Presto, MR Raps, and these are very clever use of summary statistics. You have a, you have a GYS of your uh, BMI on on your genome. You identify a collection of SNPs that are related to BMI, and then you have a GYS of of depression on, on your genome. And you look at the same set of, of, of candidate SNPs in both models, and you take those regression coefficients and you can use these meta-analytic methods to identify the causal effect on a certain assumption. Um, some of them are, are fairly strong assumptions, but um, allowing for violation of the exclusion restrictions. So that's, that's kind of, there's a little bit of an industry producing such methods. Um, there's a real issue. I, I think there are real concern with using summary statistics. It's convenient. It, it makes these, these methods easy to use. They've now actually made it easier for, for one in the sense that they've, they've created this repository of all, these, um, of all these association measures and you can just call it, use their software and, and question, query. I want the causal effect of BMI on depression and then it gives you a number. And so it, it kind of flies in the face of, of study design, thinking about selection bias, think about the individual level data carefully. Um, and, and I think there, there have been enough disasters with these methods that hopefully we're kind of moving away from them. And we're going back to analyzing individual level data and not necessarily meta-analysis, or at least combining them. So um, the work I've done is in, in I think this, the second bucket, non-meta-analysis methods, these are methods based on individual level data that you might have in an observational study or case control study. Um, many IV methods such as last so penalized methods, um, two-stage thresholding versus methods that work with single possibly valid uh, IV. So there are two kinds of methods here that fall under this. Lasso methods and two-stage regression methods. These are methods that basically allow you to have a subset of your candidate IVs being valid. So lasso will require that at least 50% of your IVs are valid and it will find the valid IVs. And then two stage, uh, so that's sometimes referred to as, as majority rule. 
and so on for majority voting. At least 50% of your IVs are valid. I will find them for you and adjust, for, and adjust the analysis accordingly. And then there's two stage thresholding methods that, are, that um, relax that somewhat and rely on so called plurality voting. That's a, a weaker condition, which I'm not going to get into in the interest of time. Um, the, the, the main point is that both, both are required that at least a subset of a sufficient large subset of your of your IVs are valid, satisfy the three core IV assumptions. And then, of course, you rely on linearity of, 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 of that the, the, the world is linear, okay? Um, and then um, there, there are two um, methods that do not require any valid ID. In fact, they would work even if you only had one candidate ID. Um, and one is called MRG by E. It's actually quite easy to explain what it does. It's also out of uh, George Davis Smith lab. Um, they basically assume that in your first stage regression, very similar to what I'm going to describe today. In fact, let me let me postpone this for, for a second because the, the assumption is um, a special case of, of the one that I'm going to be leveraging today. Uh, today I will discuss MR genius and an MR mystery is, is an alternative method that we developed recently, which I'm not going to discuss today, but I come back to um, at the end of the talk. So our, our approach is known as G estimation with no interaction with a measure selection. And this is where genius comes from and MR stands for Mendeley randomization. Um, uh, G estimation connects this work to genius, genius work. Um, if you're familiar with G estimation, uh, it's a standard pr procedure that allows you to identify causal effects under uh, the assumption of no measure confounding or with a valid ID to use G estimation. So this approach, as actually extending those two methods to allow for an invalid ID. So MR genius considers um, the following data sharing mechanism, and I'm gonna to stick to this. You can relax this somehow, uh, but the relaxation is not that interesting. So I'm gonna to stick to the simple model. Furthermore, this is the model that's been assumed in this literature. And so I, I will just build on that. We've, we've, made, we've tried to relax this to make it as non parametric as possible. And we have a paper uh, on archive where we do that. Um, but I'm gonna assume that the world is linear in this sense. This function can be any function of U, that function can be any function of U, your measure confounding, and you're interested in the causal effect of A on Y. But now I'm gonna allow for exclusion restriction violation because I'm allowing for the ID to have a causal effect on Y, even after having condition on the A on measure confounded. The, this model can be viewed as imposing both ID4 A and ID4 um, A pro that should be that should have been ID for B. So if you recall, these were the assumptions under, um, under which we can identify the average causal effect. And the assumptions were that there was no interaction between A and U in the alpha model, or no interaction between G and U in the treatment model. And so this is an intersection of those two assumptions. We have no inter interactions at all involving U and A and U and G. Under those, those conditions will show that one can sometimes still identify gamma A, even though G has an invalid ID. And I, as I stated, this model can be relaxed under certain orthogonality conditions I'm not gonna get into. Identification of ATA in, entails identifying gamma A. So what we showed is that throwing away IV3, the exclusion restriction assumption, and replacing it with IV4 dash, the one that I gave on the prior slide, flipping IV1, IV relevance, and IV2 independence assumption. And we can also relax this, but I'm not gonna really discuss it. We discuss in the paper. Um, the average treatment effect is identified by the following quantity. And so um, the, the wild statistic, if you recall, didn't have this term. It only had the covariance between the SNP and the outcome divided by the covariance between this treatment and the, and, and the SNP. And what we've done now, we've inserted an additional residual. So you regress the treatment on the SNP, you take the, the residual from the regression and you multiply it with the residual from the SNP and you take the covariance between this product of residual and your outcome and the divided by the covariance between the treatment and this product of residual. It's instructed to compare it with the wall estimate, the standard IV estimate, both are the following form. It's a ratio of a weighted outcome divided by a weighted, a weighted average of outcome and divided by the weighted average of treatment. Where the wild statistic chooses for weight, the residual, um, the, the centered ID, whereas um, genius uses as, as weight, the product of residuals. 
And it turns out this does the trick under these assumptions that it actually recovers the average causal effect. Interpretation of MR genius is rather, uh, is rather than using the invalid IBG, equivalently using this choice of weight, you should use this alternative choice as an ID. And so this has implications for how you implement this. It's actually quite simple. So how do you implement this? You just modify your two stage D squares. You perform in the first stage. So two stage D squares, the first stage is usually you regress the treatment on the Kennedy ID. So rather than doing that, you replace, you regress the treatment on this modified IV, which is now the product of these two residuals. And then you obtain a fitted value from that linear regression, A hat. You take that fitted value and then you perform these squares regression of Y on that fitted value. And the fact that you replace the original treatment with this product of residuals will completely correct for confounding bias under our assumption. Then one can show that the resulting two stage D squares estimator gamma hat A is in large samples unbiased for the AT. So these are some simulations that we, we ran. Um, there are a number of methods here that, that I, I described. These are all available methods at the time we wrote this paper. MR Egger might be the most familiar one, um, but we also use um, two stage least squares. Our uncle two stage least squares, assuming you actually observe um, the valid IVs. Um, CISVIV, is, uh, these are all lasso based, and these are those methods that work on a majority rule. So at least 50% of the IVs are correct. And two stage um, thresholding. Um, is based on um, rely on plurality um, voting rule and M. R. Eger um, relied on what they call the inside assumption, which I'm not going to really get into. Um, the, the point is, <coughs> and then we have two versions of M. R. Genius, uh, one which is a simple version I described above, and another one that's known to be a little more efficient under certain conditions. And then for each of the methods, we implemented three different sample sizes, increasing sample size. And I, what I have here is I have two, two settings. The first setting for scenario is these are the number of invalid IDs. So we had a 10 ID candidate IDs. And, and then we increase the number of invalid IDs and we perform the method to estimate the causal effect. And, 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 and so this is um, IV1 is, is true, IV2 is true, exclusion restriction is false. Uh, and here we are also violated the independent assumption. So IV relevance, it's true, but the independence assumption is violated. Okay, and so this is just to illustrate that MR genius actually still works under those conditions. So we strictly only need one of the assumptions. And, and, <coughs> and so, so this is just a table of the median absolute value of bias. And what it just shows is that as sample size increases, the estimator becomes more and more accurate. The bias vanishes, which you want to see. So this mirror is consistent. And um, as the number of invalid IVs uh, increase, the method still remains consistent. So that's what this is telling us that as theory predicts, under our assumptions, the method performs quite well. And then we compare it to a number of other methods and they also perform well when they're supposed to perform well. Two stage D squared performs well when all the IVs are correct. And then breaks down as soon as you have invalid IVs. The last two methods perform well, although they sometimes require large sample size to do so. When the number of IVs, invalid IVs is growing, but it's still less than 50%. So it's still, it's still consistent. So these are the, all the lasso methods. Um, but past that point, they all break down. Okay. And likewise for two stage, so for these two stage thresholding methods. And MR Eger in this setting didn't do well at all, except in the value setting. And I do have to say it's a little unfair that we have it here because MR Eger is really a large number of IV methods. So, so this is not, and we said so in the paper that this is not a reflection of how we should, it would perform in general, because in principle, it, it will do well even if, if all IVs are, are, are invalid. And you see that um, as the bias goes down, sample size goes up. But this is also the fact that it, it's, it, the bias is large is a reflection of the fact that in fact, we only consider 10 candidate IVs and, and really they require a large number of IVs. Um, the, the, this is just the efficiency 
Um, I don't really have much to say here, except that um, when it works, compared to two stage P squares, it, it, you get a larger variance. So you pay, you pay some price for this additional robustness when you don't need it. Um, however, when, when um, in all the other settings, um, none of two stage P squares obviously doesn't, no longer works. And so, and, and as it turns out, its variance also goes up, interestingly. Um, let me just keep going. So we, we applied this to uh, um, an analysis of the, uh, uh, questioning the, the effect of diabetes on cognitive scores. This is using the HRS data. <clears throat> and so um, in the analysis, we had six um, IVs that were found to be six SNPs that have been documented to be related to diabetes. So we instrumented diabetes diagnosis with, with those six IVs. Um, the observation analysis just refers to a regression analysis where you adjusted for all measured covariates. So throughout, we adjusted for covariates um, and found that diabetes was harmful um, with respect to memory score decline, um, and, and, but the, the effect was not significant. Um, um, and the concern was whether there was some residual confounding. And so we use IV analyses and here, here they are, two stage least squares. And all of them, in fact, besides YMR Genius, recovers uh, an effect estimate that suggests that in fact, um, um, diabetes is protective with respect to memory. Um, and, and interestingly, um, these methods, in fact, um, if you look at the, the, the number of IVs that they found to be appropriate, they all seem to suggest that um, um, all of them are actually appropriate IVs. So these are a number of instruments selected as invalid. So they, they, they tend to think that all IVs are, are valid and they will use all six of them. Uh, MR Genius recovered the, an effect that was larger in the same direction, direction as the original study, but, but somewhat larger, okay. Now, um, just a little bit more about the identifying assumptions that, that, that we made. Um, there's something that I did not discuss. So recall that the wall estimate is a ratio of two numbers. So whenever you have that, you have to be careful that you're not dividing by zero. And so this, the ratio is well defined. You're not dividing by zero provided um, the, the covariance, the correlation between the treatment and the SNP is, is non-zero. And so this is in fact guaranteed by IV1, the IV relevance assumption. So what is the, the equivalent requirement for MR genius? So the MR genius estimate was this, this ratio. And again, um, it's only well defined provided that the denominator is not equal to zero. And as it turns out, if you do a little bit of algebra, you'll find that that requires that the variance of A is, is, is depends on the SNP. So the variance of the treatment of the, of the exposure must depend on, on the SNP. And, and so this is not, um, unlike the IV relevance assumption, it's, it's, it requires a strengthening of the IV relevance assumption because the IV relevance assumption says that the SNP has an impact, has an effect on the treatment. And what we're requiring here is that, 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 that G does not only affect the mean of A, but must also affect the variance of A. That, that, that the effect of, of, of the SNP on, on the endogenous variable must render the first stage residual heteroscedastic. Okay, so let's talk about that for a minute. So this assumption almost always holds when A is binary. And this is because when A is binary, the variance of A given G is, is P times one minus T. It depends on the mean. So if you have the standard IV relevance that the mean depends on G, then the variance will depend on G. And you can come up with some examples where that's actually break down, which is why I have almost always, like when G is binary, turns out there's a point mass, particular parameter value that you can choose such that this assumption doesn't hold. And so it would be the case if you pick the probability of A equals one, given G equals one is equal to the probability of A equals zero, given G equals zero, something like that. But again, this is what my petition would refer to as a set of measure, measure, measure zero. You would have to be really unlucky for that parameter value to occur in your data set. Just a single parameter value would give problems. So for, for binary exposure, this is almost always going to be satisfied with the standard IV relevance assumption. 
What's interesting is what it requires in continuous for continuous on Dutch variable, which is often what people are interested in in, in, in a lot of, of MR analyses. So for continuous A, the, the strong IV relevance requires that the candidate IV SNP has essentially heterogeneous effects on the phenotype of interest. I.e. that G does not only influence the mean of A, but also its scale. In other words, if you want to think of it at, at the description level, it means folks who have the exposure value at the, you know, the 95th quantile of that distribution experience a very different exposure, uh, uh, and I, um, a SNP effect at, at, at the median versus at the, at the, at the first quantile. quantile. Okay. And so in fact, there's one way to articulate what this assumption means. There's a simple data frame mechanism, which is actually very salient with what people think actually happens in genetic happy which is the strong IV assumption is implied by a first stage random effect model that I've described here in equation one, that your, your phenotype defining your exposure is a random effect model where what's random now is the effect of the SNP. So it varies from individual to individual. And, and that, 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 that random effect is independent of UI is exogenous. So what this is saying is essentially alpha i is a is a is a form of a, there's a latent interaction. There's a variable that you haven't measured that is interacting with a and creates different values for the association between g and, and a as you vary from one person to a different person and that latent variable changes values. So alpha gi is a random effect capturing gene environment interactions which are uh, measured environmental factors. This is one of the candidate explanation for, for the missing heritability um, that's been put forward in, in, in genetic epi. That's one model, that there are a lot of latent interactions that we do not know about. And so that if that were in fact the case, then this one can show that this model underlying data stream would in fact imply that this stronger IV relevance assumption, which we do not usually require for IV methods, does in fact hold. So such G by E interactions are widely considered to be pervasive in genetic epi. Nevertheless, even though they might be present, such interactions may be weak as each SNP may only have a small effect. Therefore, what we've, what we've, we've, we've come up to is that, down to is that we may have resolved the potential violation of exclusion restriction bias, but we might have aggravated the weak IV problem. So we really need to address the weak IV problem. So to address this issue, one can potentially leverage availability of GWAS data of large number of potentially invalid and weak IVs, as long as one can simultaneously account for both sources of bias, exclusion restriction and the weak bias. And so, of course, we have to come up with, a, with an acronym for that. <laughs> which we developed and we call it a mini weak IV or Maui genius approach to do just that. So how does it work? This work builds on extensive mini weak generalized methods of movements um, introduced by New and Win Mayer. This is fairly, these are econometricians, it's fairly mathematical and technical. So I'm not gonna go into the, the description of the, how the methods actually work and why they work and what the theorems are. Um, I, I will mention though what, what our contribution is. So what, what New and, and Winmayer proved in, in 2009, they established that IV methods can be severely biased and yield invalid inferences when valid but weak IVs are used. So they were dealing with valid IV, except the IV relevance was an issue. And they have many, many such kind of IVs. They show that a, a, a specific implementation of, of generalized method of movement known as continuing Continuous updating um, estimator Q remains consistent in norm, asymptotic normal under many weak IV asymptotic analysis where the number of SNPs is allowed to grow with sample size, although each added SNP only adds very little information. So it's very careful analysis where you really want to you put pressure on your on your data stream mechanism. So you allow for very weak IV. So each each IV itself is has a very small signal. But then you add a sample size increasing, you add the number of IVs, but you keep it at a level where um, <coughs> you would get biased if you were to use a standard IV analysis. Okay. 
The binning weak ID large sample analysis reveals a correction needed to standard errors of Q to yield confidence interval with nominal coverage. And so, so there are two results that are relevant in this work. First is that don't use GMM, use Q, because Q is consistent. Whatever Q is, use Q. The software to do it, use it if you have any valid but weak IDs. And then the second, their second contribution was to show that even though Q is, is in large sample unbiased, the variance from the standard technology uh, of GMM adapted to Q will, will show that the standard variance is actually um, smaller. The standard estimate of, of the variance understates the uncertainty. And so they propose a correction. And this correction accounts for the fact that you're allowing the number of IDs to grow with sample size. And that allows you to get valid inferences. So Maui Genius, which um, Ting Yi, um, a postdoc working, working with, with, with me on this, um, is a meaning weak invalid ID queue, which accounts for both violation of exclusion restriction and many weak IVs. Thus, it extends new and mean mayor in important ways and requires a somewhat more involved analysis. And the main contribution here, this is for folks who worry about semi-fragile theory, is that in the new framework, they have no nuisance parameters. We're gonna allow for many nuisance parameters. And so we had to modify their proof arguments. The approach also gives an empirical measure of potential ID strength. So, so what we get out of our analysis is when you do an analysis, it will tell you whether or not you have this problem. You should worry about Asian trust, your inferences, you have a weak ID problem. So, um, as I said, I wasn't going to go into the statistical te techniques to do this. Um, we've implemented it. I uh, will go over some simulation and application. Um, so, <laughs> so here are some simulations. So there are two estimators here. There's um, Genius GMM, which is a standard Genius um, estimator. And then we have this Genius Maui, which is this Q with the, the correct variance adjustment. This first table is one of, of this displaying the, the bias, the true beta, the true causal effect is 0.4. So we have the, the mean here, the standard error. And then, we, and then we consider two settings, one where you have sample size 5,000 and you have 20 candidate invalid IDs, weak invalid IDs, and then one where you have more, okay? 50 in, candidate invalid IDs, same sample size. Gamma, you should think of it as it, it adjusts the extent to which the heteroscedasticity assumption uh, holds. So this is the association between between Z and A, uh, G and, and A, rather, the SNP and the, and the big treatment. So small values, you have very, very weak IV. We keep it somewhat small throughout, but we allow it to increase in these three scenarios to see how things perform. And then this measure is our measure for whether or not you should worry about the weak IV. And, and roughly speaking, our, our sense is that once it's above 10, um, you should be okay. okay. And so 1.8, nothing works. You have large bias, and this is based on a thousand simulations. You have large bias because the mean, the true mean is 0.4. You end up with a Monte Carlo average of 1.34, regardless of which method you, you use. But however, you get some correction. The, the size of the bias is, is um, roughly half for, for Maui than for GMN. And then the, as, as the signal somewhat increases, but you still have a weak ID by any, any measure such that the bias of genius GMM is still considerable compared to 0.4. Um, the bias of, of Maui is significantly smaller. Okay. And then this is obviously even better when you have more, more ID. You get there a lot faster. The first scenario, you're already almost there and then you, you're basically there as the size of gamma increases. And you can see that also with more IDs that this amount of signal is much larger. So this is again a measure that will tell you whether or not you have you must worry about weak IV. So that was about the, the bias, it's considered the variance. And so here I have three estimators. I have the standard GMM, which is biased already, so we shouldn't really care about the variance, but I have it here. And then we have the genius Q, which was the one that um, gives you the bias correction. And then we have one where we further adjust for the standard error correction. Okay, so we adjust both the bias and the standard error. And it essentially says that um, both adjustment, as long as you have a sufficient signal, even though you're still in a weak IV regime, 
um, you, you do quite well. And, and what we're looking for here is the coverage of the confidence interval and the nominal level is 0.95 and you get there quite quite quickly with this, this method. G, Genius Q doesn't get there ever um, as it turns out because it doesn't have, though it corrects the bias, it doesn't have the right standard error. And then Genius GMM is, is never gets there. Whether both because of bias and variance, and things get better when you have more IE. Um, what else do I want to say about this? So, so I've only focused on these three estimators, obviously, because this is the only estimator I know that could formally account for both sorts of problems: exclusion, restriction, and 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 um, and weak IV, and wanting to focus on the operational characteristics of those estimators. So we we applied the, the estimator to the UK biobank and application where we're looking at the association of BMI and blood pressure, where we excluded people who are on blood pressure medication at the baseline. Um, it's a very large sample. It's the beauty of our UK Biobank, bio uh, close to 300,000 people. And we had um, 97 SNPs, candidate SNPs in, in, in this. And, and the beauty is if you have a lot of candidate SNPs, you're, you're somewhat less concerned about violation of the crucial restriction, although you should always be concerned about it because the, the world is much better if you can select your, 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 your IVs appropriately. Um, but now you're likewise less concerned about the weak IV bias. And so you can, what, what we found was that compared to all other existing methods, MR, um, so MR Egger um, is kind of one of the most popular approaches. It's one of those meta-analysis approach. Um, yields an estimate that's considerably smaller than any of the other estimates, um, but it's actually quite close to our estimate. And so it seems like MRI there seems to at least correct in our direction uh, compared to 2 cg square LML, um, inverse variance weighted IV, um, the bias inverse variance weighted IV and MR wraps. And these are all methods I can't, I don't just don't have enough time to, to, to describe what they are, but there are various methods that are out there in the literature that people are using in the applied papers to deal with these problems. Um, and so, <coughs> and the standard error is, is, is um, actually um, uh, provides a signal at least in this application. And so the, the idea here is that if you believe the assumptions, um, uh, your inferences might be more credible even in presence of exclusion and restriction violation and weak IV uh, bias uh, and demonstrate a signal for an association between BMI and and blood pressure. So in conclusion, we've, we've extended MR genius to multiple settings of interest, including estimating causal risk ratios for binary outcome, binary treatment using log link for first stage model, survival analysis, um, mitigation analysis, same, um, and then we've also done some semi work where we've developed um, so-called W and multiply robust estimators. Um, now, an interesting question one might ask is that MR genius clearly leverages heteroscedastic uh, first stage residuals, an assumption grounded in the presence of um, latent G by E interactions with unmeasured environmental factors. Um, one question you might ask is, is it possible to likewise develop an analogous approach that which doesn't look at the first stage regression, but rather looks at the outcome re residual and, and ask, could we uh, likewise leverage um, latent G by E interactions in the outcome model that might induce heteroscedasticity in the outcome residual to identify the, the causal effect. And it turns out that you can. Um, uh, the answer is a resounding yes. And we have a, a paper on, on uh, Meta Archive and, and um, that demonstrate how you might go about doing that. And so this is kind of the parallel of MR Genius and the acronym is MR Mystery. Um, I won't go into what it, that means now. So thank you so much for your, for your attention. Um, I'll thank all the collaborators for all this work. Um, Mary Schooling is an epidemiologist who does a lot of genetic epi and a lot of MR studies and keeps us, tries to keep us uh, honest about the actual interpretation of our findings <laughs> as far as science goes. And um, it's funded by the NIH and here are a list of papers related to some of the results that I presented. Thank you so much. <laughs>